Number two, did residence on free soil make him free? Six justices, the five Southerners and Greer, said no. No. Why not? Well, maybe if he'd sued in Illinois, he might have been free. But he went back to Missouri. So the laws of Missouri apply to him. Not, so forget it. His being in Illinois doesn't matter since he left Illinois. They're not applicable. All right, what about the territory? He's not free there because Congress lacked the power to prohibit slavery. The Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. Therefore, the prohibition of slavery in that territory was null and void. Congress did not have the power to enact this. And here, Chief Justice Taney adopted in full the sort of constitutional reasoning that Southern political leaders had been developing in the 1840s and 1850s. The territories are the property of all the people of all the states, right? Um, they're acquired by the nation. The Louisiana Tur Purchase was purchased by, with national money that Southerners and Northerners had all contributed, tax money, whatever. Um, so Congress, the, the territories are held for all the people of all the states, and Congress lacks the power to kind of discriminate among the different, different parts of the country. The only thing it can do is protect property rights there. Congress cannot act against slavery. And here, Tawney refers to the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. Does everybody know what's in the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution? I'm sure. Well, if you don't, let's, we should all, I think I've got, yeah, here's my Constitution. We, um, <laughs> Yeah, I've got it right here. We should all keep a, keep a copy while it still is in effect. Um, some portions of it have been abrogated lately. I think, uh, it didn't in the Federalist Madison say that uh, the federal government cannot read all your emails and text messages, but we're doing it now, so that part is out. But the Fifth Amendment says, no person, among many other things, shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, by the federal government, life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, there were a few abolitionists who said that provision makes slavery illegal. A person is being deprived of their liberty by due, without due process of law. But very few people accepted that. Much more common was the Southern argument that a banning slavery in the territories deprived a person of his property without due process of law. And that's the argument here. Congress lacks the power to prohibit slavery because it is a violation of the Fifth Amendment uh, to the Constitution. Um, this is the opposite of what I have referred to as this freedom doctrine. The freedom doctrine, slavery is a creature of state law. It only exists where a state has established it. This is the opposite. Slavery exists everywhere under the Constitution except where a state prohibits it. So it, where, without, where there's no state acting, there's just naturally slavery. Slavery is the natural condition of all the territories, as well as the District of Columbia and any other place under a federal, um, federal jurisdiction. So what, is the, uh, what are the consequences of this? Well, the Supreme Court has declared the platform of the second largest political party in the country, the Republicans, unconstitutional. The Republican platform, if it says anything, is Congress should bar slavery from the territories. Now the Supreme Court says that doctrine, that position is unconstitutional. What does it mean for popular sovereignty? As Lincoln would pointedly ask, as we'll see in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, what happens to popular sovereignty when the Supreme Court says slavery has to go into these territories? Can a territorial legislature created by Congress exercise a power that Congress lacks. How can you, pro how, popular sovereignty doesn't mean anything he said anymore under this decision because there's no choice, there is no vote. Slavery must be there during the 
territorial phase. And certainly this decision seemed to go against the whole course of American history, as we've said. Slavery was barred in the old Northwest in 1787 by the Northwest Ordinance. Some of the people who voted for that then helped to write and ratify the Constitution. They didn't seem to think there was a contradiction there. The Missouri Compromise had existed from 1820 to 1854 without anybody really saying it was unconstitutional. Um, so it seems, to, uh, it seems to cut against, as I say, the actual history of, um, of, uh, of the country, and it seemed kind of unnecessary. The Missouri Compromise had been repealed, so why now declare it unconstitutional? Um, now, the only thing one could say about this in a positive way is that Dred Scott and his wife were then freed by their owner, Reverend Chafee. They did not continue, and their children, they did not continue as slaves as a result of the Dred Scott decision. Unfortunately, both of them passed away within a couple of years, so they had only a year or two to enjoy uh, their freedom. Um, the daughters, though, lived much longer and did not have to go back into slavery. But the result of the, the, the I, there, is a, there is a lesson here, I suppose, among others, that the Supreme Court is not actually the proper venue for deciding de de deeply divisive issues in the country. Every once in a while they have tried. Once in a while it works. Usually it doesn't. Um, and certainly in this case, it didn't. The result was not the sectional peace that Buchanan had hoped for, but heightened antagonisms. Throughout the North, people said, we're just not abiding by, forget this, we're not abiding. In fact, this reflects the fact, they said, that the slave power controls the federal government. Here you have the slave power adjudicating through the Supreme Court trying to tell everyone in the North what to do, and this is just another example of why you better vote for the Republican Party if you don't want the slave power running everything forever. It led to a disastrous decline in the prestige of the Supreme Court. In the secession crisis, nobody said, well, why don't we take these issues to the Supreme Court? No, the Supreme Court had lost all authority moral authority, you know, at least in the northern half uh, of the country. Um, Lincoln himself, a, mo a lawyer, a guy who was used to accepting court decisions, said this was a burlesque, a burlesque of a judicial uh, decision. And he said, we don't have to, we do not have to accept it. Republicans do not have to accept it. Douglas said, what do you mean? What do you mean? That's insurrection. What do you mean? That, that's illegal. How can you say I reject the decision of the Supreme Court? And he said, well, hey, what about back in the 1830s when the Supreme Court declared the Bank of the United States constitutional? And Jackson said, I don't accept that. They said, Douglas, you were in favor of Jackson then. So Lincoln's point was people did or didn't accept Supreme Court decisions depending on what they were. Um, the Supreme Court's authority was far less established in the mid-19th century than it is today. The notion of defying a Supreme Court decision is heard around today, but no elected official is going to get up and say, I am going to directly violate a decision of the Supreme Court. I think in a, one of the turning points in this actually, I think, was in uh, seven, 90, no, 1973 was it, where the Supreme Court ordered President Nixon to turn over his Watergate tapes. Remember, he had taped his conversations, and the court ordered them turned over. And Nixon thought for a while of refusing and just saying, I'm sorry, the, we are co-equal powers. The court cannot tell a president what to do. But all his advisors said, forget it. If you do that, you'll be impeached right away. So the, uh, the, but back in the 19th century, presidents defied... Andrew Jackson and the Cherokee case. What did Andrew Jackson say when the Supreme Court ruled they couldn't just remove all these Cherokee? He said, you know, yeah, they've made their decision, now let them enforce it. They have no power to enforce it, I'm gonna do what I want. And just a couple of years after this, a few years after this, Lincoln, as president, will defy a direct order from Chief Justice Tawney to release Merriman, a man arrested in, um, 
Maryland at the beginning of the Civil War when Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus and the Chief Justice ordered him to release Merriman and Lincoln said, forget it, I don't need to listen to you. So the Supreme Court's prestige, whatever it was, was certainly weakened considerably by the Dred Scott decision.